Hello everyone, my name is uh, Andrew Knight, I'm a Veterinary Professor of Animal Welfare and I want to talk today about the uh, educational use of animals and alternatives. My story uh, really starts um, a very long time ago, uh, it seems now, when I was a veterinary student at Western Australia's Murdoch University. I finished the veterinary course there in 2001 and as you can see it's a beautiful campus there. We had a uh, rabbits uh, roaming the green grasses early in the mornings and literally kangaroos hopping around the uh, forest down at the uh, bottom of the campus. Um, I entered veterinary school uh, unsurprisingly because I wanted to help animals and also thought that I'd be able to help people too. Um, I understood that harmful animal use might be required in parts of the course, uh, but I rationalised to myself that if I was required to harm animals, uh, it would be worth it because I'd be able to do so much more good uh, for animals as a qualified veterinarian uh, at the end. But I didn't know very much about what kinds of uh, animal use there would be or about the alternatives that might be available. Uh, thus unprepared, I entered uh, first year. And in the um, first year classes, introductory anatomy classes, we would dissect uh, animals such as slugs, snails, um, earthworms, uh, body parts from abattoirs, for reasons that were never made clear, there seemed to be a strange obsession with lampreys. Um, my ability to avoid thinking too seriously about the issue served me very well uh, until around about uh, the end of uh, first year when there was a particular cell biology laboratory class. And in this particular class, uh, it was different because the animals were not um, coming to us uh, already killed and laid out on dissecting um, trays like uh, pieces of, of meat on styrofoam packaging in a supermarket. Instead these animals were still alive, they were rats that were literally running around uh, their cages uh, prior to the commencement of the laboratory uh, class. Demonstrators uh, killed those rats so that we students could dissect out the intestinal tracts which were uh, essentially um, still partially alive, the cells were still alive, so that uh, we could record the uptake of glucose and other solutions by these still living intestinal cells. I was quite sure that um, well-established scientific concepts such as these could be taught to us without killing animals to do so. Um, I wasn't aware of exactly what the alternatives uh, would be that would be available for a class like this, but I nevertheless went and told my instructors on the morning of the laboratory class that I didn't want to participate in this particular laboratory class and I requested uh, a humane alternative. Um, unfortunately on this occasion the uh, academics were hostile to the concept of humane alternatives uh, and I wasn't well prepared because I only voiced my objection on the same day as the class uh, and I didn't know what the alternatives might be. So my request for an alternative uh, was denied uh, with the result that I then boycotted the laboratory class, I refused to participate. Uh, this ended up actually costing me a grade in that particular uh, course. Um, but this stirred up a lot of controversy because it was the first time any students in, uh, had boycotted uh, a, a laboratory class for many years and some students and some faculty supported me, others were opposed to what I was doing. Uh, all of this controversy combined with financial pressures to result in the university dropping the laboratory class completely the following year and this ended up saving the lives of around about 40 rats each year I think which was absolutely worth uh, losing a grade over. I was delighted. At one point however I was called into the uh, the offices of the um, program and, and course leader and I was asked to explain my position to them. Uh, they spent an hour and a half uh, interrogating me and trying to change my views on this matter and they gave me dire warnings that what I had seen so far in the cell biology laboratory was only the tip of the iceberg compared to what I would have to do to animals later in the veterinary course and suggested that perhaps I should reconsider my choice of career. Well this didn't work in encouraging me to do that but it did uh, encourage me to go and learn a lot about the uh, types of alternatives uh, that are available for um, curricular animal use within uh, veterinary and other life and health sciences courses and the courses around the world where they're being successfully used and the educational evidence of their effectiveness. And I'm going to share with you uh, now some of what I learned. 
Uh, they were right about one thing, which was that the animal use was just the tip of the iceberg compared to what would happen later in the veterinary course. Uh, we moved on to the anatomy course where we uh, students were given, uh, each group of about four students was given a greyhound that had been killed because it wasn't racing fast enough to make a profit for the greyhound racing industry uh, anymore. Uh, and this is, uh, there are very large numbers, uh, thousands actually of greyhounds which are killed each year for this reason unfortunately. And some of those are donated uh, to veterinary schools for teaching purposes. So we would uh, dissect uh, portions of these greyhounds uh, each week. We would tackle a different part of the body. It might be uh, the front leg or the hind leg or the chest cavity or some other portion of the body. And the greyhounds would go into the uh, cool rooms in between. There are a few more uh, upsetting uh, slides uh, to follow this one. So if you don't want to see more horrible pictures, please uh, look away now. Uh, we also dissected animals like uh, cats, uh, the heads of horses, as you can see there, and a variety of other uh, animals in the anatomy classes. Uh, there was very highly invasive experiments in the physiology uh, course in which uh, living animals had experiments conducted on them, demonstration experiments to demonstrate well-established concepts in physiology. Uh, for example, we would... Uh, or well, not myself, I, I refuse to do this, but students would uh, anaesthetize uh, sheep, uh, cut various nerves, including nerves leading to the heart, force uh, their sheep to uh, breathe various gases. In one case, the air supply was uh, occluded entirely, so there was no air uh, coming to the sheep. Um, do things like uh, ligate uh, major arteries, so um, cut the blood supply, uh, running up major arteries and see what this would do. So um, these animals were unfortunately killed uh, at the end of these procedures by, by students under anesthesia. Um, this was followed uh, in the surgery course by um, terminal surgery laboratories. So in these laboratories, uh, healthy young pigs typically would be anesthetized by students uh, they would conduct uh, surgical procedures on them to practice those procedures and the animals would again be killed uh, prior to regaining consciousness uh, at the end of the procedure um, myself and a classmate uh, refused to do this as well but we uh, still had to attend all of the terminal surgery labs as observers um, humane teaching methods have been developed for uh, more than a decade or two now for these sorts of procedures and implemented widely in progressive uh, life and health sciences courses around the world. They include these sorts of things, high quality uh, videos and computer simulations of uh, animal dissections and experiments on animals, ethically sourced cadavers obtained uh, from animals that have died naturally or in accidents or been euthanized for genuine medical or severe intractable behavioral reasons and then donated for teaching purposes. Uh, uh, anatomy specimens, so body parts, can be uh, sourced from ethically sourced cadavers or otherwise and preserved in a variety of different ways, uh, eliminating the need for sourcing of new body parts each year. Non-invasive, uh, self-experimentation on oneself and one's uh, classmates to demonstrate uh, physiological concepts, clinical and surgical skills models and simulators, and very importantly, uh, supervise clinical and surgical experiences uh, using real patients that benefit from those uh, procedures under close one-to-one -one supervision. So here we have examples of uh, some of the computer simulations of dissections, and there are many of those that have been developed. Um, some of these uh, include um, very high quality uh, images of professionally performed dissections. Uh, we call those prosections. Uh, uh, this is useful because you can very clearly see the internal organs, whereas in a student dissection it's uh, common to unfortunately mash up and destroy the uh, very fragile internal organs. Uh, and once that has occurred, of course, they can be put back together and uh, it's hard to see what the important structures are. So these uh, prosections allow students to see those clearly. 
Uh, there can be gross or macroscopic anatomical specimens, so visible to the naked eye, uh, juxtaposed with uh, microscopic or histo histological uh, specimens, so we can see what the cellular architecture uh, is uh, within different regions of the body. Um, this is an example of a computer simulation that's available uh, via the internet uh, from the uh, Colorado uh, Veterinary School. And this one is about the anatomy of the dog. It's possible to uh, select different parts of the dog, in this case the head, and to choose to explore either the bony anatomy, the soft tissue anatomy, the radiographic anatomy, or indeed the clinical anatomy. Uh, if a student chooses the soft tissue anatomy of the head, uh, they'll be presented with different parts of the head to examine. Uh, they can choose to um, select uh, different uh, parts of the head, such as the masseter muscle here, and receive uh, standardized information uh, of importance, such as the point of origin and insertion of the muscle, the uh, innovation, the main uh, nerve supply, and the, the action of the muscle, what it does. You can zoom in for a closer look. They can uh, smoothly roll the head around and rotate it and look at it from different angles. Uh, students can choose to view the radiographic anatomy as well. You can see the frontal sinus has been highlighted there in the skull of the dog um, and learn about those structures. Likewise, the veins underneath the tongue here, uh, the glottis, it's very important to be able to correctly identify the entrance to the airway, um, the trachea. Uh, this is important because we often pass endotracheal tubes uh, for connecting these patients to anaesthetic gas machines and maintaining them on gaseous anaesthesia. Here's a good example of a, a computer simulation that was developed for medical students um, by um, a person who is a medical illustrator, uh, Roy Schneider. And it allows a student to drag uh, a mouse button across a slider on the screen and in doing so, melt the tissue layers away from the uh, most superficial all the way down to the deepest, so all the way down to the bones of the skull, actually. And unlike in a real dissection, if you drag the uh, mouse button back in the opposite direction, you can uh, replace all the tissues back again and repeat that as many times as you like. Um, you can choose to uh, zoom in and select particular muscles, such as the muscle next to the nose here. And uh, if you click on the muscle in the simulation, the muscle will contract. And in this case, the nose will twitch. So you'll be able to see what the muscle actually does. So these, of course, are characteristics you, that you, you certainly don't see in a real dissection. If you had a human or an animal head and you are uh, you poked one of the muscles and saw something move, you would probably start to get very worried. Um, so those things don't happen in, in normal dissections of uh, anatomical specimens, but are available in the simulation. So there's extra functionality there. Here's an example of a simulation of a frog dissection. You can choose to look at the dissection part, the diagrams of functional anatomy, and learn about the ecology of the frog as well. Uh, if students are running the dissection simulation, they will need to select instruments from a virtual toolkit, drag them across the uh, correct parts of, of the frog, and if they are able to do that successfully, it will cause a little video to run showing uh, this procedure being done in a real frog. Um, and students can also choose to uh, view functional diagrams of the anatomy of the heart in this case. And uh, by clicking on the right button, uh, we can get the blood to actually flow, the arterial blood and the venous blood to throw, flow through the appropriate chambers of the heart. And once again, this is not something that you would see, of course, in a normal dissection of a dead animal. So again, these simulations can op offer extra functionality and learning opportunities. Um, you can even click on the button here and uh, hear what the, the frog sounds like in its natural habitat and learn about the uh, ecology of the frog as well. And I've uh, tried to do this uh, occasionally in front of large audiences to, to make a, a simulated croaking sound and it's gone very badly so I'm not going to attempt uh, to do so here. But the simulation will do this for you. 
Ethically sourced cadavers uh, can be obtained, as I said, from animals that have died naturally or in accidents or been euthanized for genuine medical reasons or occasionally severe and intractable behavioral problems. Uh, not uh, animals that have been uh, killed for ethically questionable reasons and then re repurposed into teaching. Those cadavers can then be uh, preserved in a variety of different methods. Uh, that's uh, me in our anatomy museum when I was a veterinary student. This is um, a horse's head that's been sectioned and each of those sections has been placed into a pot containing uh, formaldehyde or a similar preservative solution along with chemicals uh, designed to uh, not only prevent bacterial uh, putrefaction and uh, dissolution of those tissues but also to preserve colour. Uh, it's possible to uh, perfuse uh, animals that are being uh, euthanized for, for genuine medical reasons to when they are uh, unconscious in between the time of uh, being anaesthetized, uh, made unconscious and the time of death. It's possible to uh, perfuse them, uh, them so that an epoxy resin can circulate within their bloodstream so that it uh, fills uh, blood vessels and it's also possible to do this with uh, the airways of animals. Uh, the animal is then uh, euthanized uh, so it hasn't actually experienced anything which you certainly wouldn't want it to do so. Uh, and you can then dissolve away the soft tissues with a mild, mild acid solution over a prolonged period of time leaving uh, colored casts of things like airways and blood vessels and here we see the uh, blood vessels and structures of the kidney I think of a cow. It's possible to plastinate uh, specimens as well. We can see a squid, a plastinated squid at the bottom of the slide here. Plastination involves several chemical steps and evacuation, uh, and it removes uh, the water from uh, tissues of um, preserved specimens, uh, leaving them with a plasticky texture and a plasticky feel and a, a, faint, a faint whiff as well. Um, so these are means of permanently preserving these body parts. This is an example of uh, the cast of the blood vessels of the liver and gallbladder of a dog um, at the Tufts University uh, Veterinary School, which is one of the world's leading veterinary schools. Uh, and this was obtained from an ethically sourced cadaver. Uh, likewise, we have another one from Tufts. This is the airways of the lungs and bronchial system of the dog, also from an ethically sourced cadaver. Um, and even the largest of animals have been successfully plastinated. This is Gunther von Hagen with one of his plastinated specimens. He was the anatomist that first developed the plastination technique and he has several exhibitions permanently traveling the world of plastinated animals, uh, none of who were killed for the purposes of the exhibition. They have all essentially been uh, died naturally or in accidents or been euthanized for medical reasons, so ethically sourced cadavers. Uh, and also he has an exhibition of traveling uh, people as well. And they're uh, absolutely fascinating. I recommend them to anyone uh, if you have the opportunity to go and see one of these. It's a great way to, to learn about the uh, anatomy and the functional anatomy of animals and people. This is uh, Dr. Brioni Dixon. She was one of the first uh, veterinarians to graduate from the University of Queensland School of Veterinary Medicine uh, without harming animals in her surgical training. Here she is uh, using an ethically sourced cadaver, so pr practicing placing a chest drain this is an important clinical procedure allowing us to remove uh, fluids such as blood or, or air from the chest cavity for animals, dogs, uh, for example, that have been in a traumatic incident such as a road traffic accident. Uh, by removing uh, blood or air from the lung space, it allows the lungs to, uh, from the chest space, it allows the lungs to reinflate, um, uh, assisting the breathing of these animals. So ethically sourced cadavers can be used to practice a variety of clinical procedures uh, as well as surgery. Um, computer simulations are very numerous. The er early computer simulations of animal experiments were criticized for being overly simplistic and then when you look at that you can understand why. Uh, modern computer simulations however have high quality video clips of animals undergoing actual experimental procedures 
and we can certainly uh, discuss the ethics of subjecting those animals to those procedures but given that it has been done at least by uh, using the video clip uh, uh, in an ongoing basis uh, the procedures don't need to be repeated uh, every year so they can include those video clips they can include things like uh, virtual bench tops with uh, oscilloscopes whereby students have to uh, do things like drag um, virtual dissected hind legs of uh, frogs and place those over the top of electrodes, uh, apply electrical stimuli to these muscles and observe the uh, action potential uh, and the response in the muscle on the screen of the oscilloscope. So these uh, experiments have been conventionally done in uh, using di dissected frog hind legs. Uh, they can be done using the simulation here and many others uh, can be similarly uh, simulated as well. There are uh, many models available for teaching students high school biology and also for teaching uh, clinical procedures, in this case to laboratory technicians. Uh, the uh, rat tail vein is uh, the location of choice for taking blood from rats and uh, this uh, simulated rat uh, on the left there uh, called Sniffy enables people to uh, practice um, taking blood from a rat tail vein which is not an easy thing to do if you haven't practiced that. There are mannequins which are more advanced uh, such as uh, Critical Care Jerry here, uh, the dog mannequin and Fluffy the cat mannequin and they enable um, veterinary students and veterinary nursing students for example to practice and even pet owners to practice things like mouth to snout resuscitation, uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, uh, intubation for connection to an anaesthetic gas machine, taking a blood sample uh, using simulated blood solution and fake uh, veins, feeling for a pulse, listening for a pulse, listening for breath sounds and being able to hear normal pulse and breath sounds but also a variety of pathological pulse and breath sounds too uh, if an instructor uh, selects one of about 20 or so uh, different pathological heart or breath sounds. Here Dr. Dixon is practicing uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation on uh, the mannequin uh, as an alternative to the um, historical way of practicing this by inducing cardiac arrest in actual uh, dogs and then students attempting to resuscitate them sometimes successfully other times not which of course is incredibly sad for uh, those dogs that did not recover. Uh, here's Dr. Dixon again, this time um, practicing um, bovine rectal palpation, which is something that vets need to learn to do if, to diagnose pregnancy in particularly dairy cows and the state of pregnancy and whether there's any pathology going on uh, with respect to the uterus in the pregnancy. So in this case she's got her arm up the bottom of the cow which is normal um, and instead of filling around inside the intestines uh, and using those like a glove to fill the rest of the abdomen, um, she has her fingertips inside a thimble. When the thimble is connected to a robotic arm which is connected to a computer simulation and the instructor can program the simulation to be uh, early pregnant, late stage pregnant non-pregnant uh, uh, to have some kind of pathology or some other situation and uh, Brioni has to feel uh, um, around inside the abdomen to try to diagnose the state of pregnancy of the cow there. So this is a haptic simulator, one which applies uh, pressure to the fingertips which is anatomically appropriate depending upon where inside the simulation the uh, student is feeling. And uh, these now exist certainly for the cow, as you can see. Also, there's one for a horse um, for diagnosis of equine colic, abdominal pain. There is one uh, to help to practice palpating the abdomen of a cat. Um, no doubt others will come. Now, those sorts of simulations can be pretty expensive. And what should uh, a veterinary school or other course do if they're in a poorer region of the world and can't afford those. So here we have 
you can see beautiful wooden carvings have been made uh, based upon uh, soft rubberized simulations of the head of a dog by local craftspeople in Thailand. And you can see that, of course, they're not flexible. Uh, they don't allow the same level of realism, but they're nevertheless somewhat useful as demonstration tools for instructing people in how to give pills, uh, apply muzzles, and so on. Now, what about uh, teaching uh, surgery? The traditional way that uh, surgery has been taught has been to practice surgical procedures on healthy animals and then to, unfortunately, kill those uh, animals at the start of the procedure. Uh, students ha are usually placed in groups of three. One student will be the anaesthetist, one will be the surgeon, one will be the assistant surgeon, uh, and they rotate uh, every week. So when uh, I did the veterinary surgery course at my uh, university, there were 13 of these terminal surgeries. So you got to be the surgeon or assistant surgeon on two thirds of those uh, 13. So something like around about uh, eight or nine of those um, surgeries. Um, and the animals are typically killed by students via anaesthetic overdose uh, at the end of the procedure if they have managed to survive that far because not all of them do because students are uh, inexperienced uh, at maintaining anaesthesia and slow at their surgeries as well. So alternative surgery training ideally comprises three stages. Um, firstly, students should practice their basic manual skills such as suturing and instrument handling using things like knot tying boards, plastic organs and other models. Secondly, they should progress to simulating a surgical procedure on an ethically sourced cadaver. And thirdly, they should um, perform, they should start by observing uh, real surgery on, on real patients that benefit from the procedures. They should then uh, progress to assisting with those and then performing those procedures on the close one-to-one -one supervision, similarly to the training of uh, human surgeons. And a key part of these, very popular part of these, is animal shelter neutering programs. Uh, and these are very popular because uh, homeless animals uh, from the animal shelter are neutered so that they won't go on to breed and contribute to the overpopulation problem the shelter is probably trying to solve. Uh, it provides a very worthwhile community service. It increases the chance of adoption of those animals. And it provides uh, veterinary students with experience at neutering, uh, which are among the most common and important procedures that new graduates will need to be able to perform. So animal shelter neutering programs are an extremely popular part of alternative surgical training programs. <coughs> <coughs> Um, this is an example of a simple model. This is the DAISY, the Dog Abdominal Surrogate for Instructional Exercises. It's basically just a foam cylinder with multiple layers of foam and some small uh, coloured uh, red threads running through the foam to simulate blood vessels, some foam intestine in the middle of it. A student can make an incision and uh, go in and find the intestines, pull them out, uh, wet them down to make sure they don't dry out as you would do in a real patient, uh, extract a simulated foreign body from the intestines or a uh, portion of diseased intestine, uh, suture together the edges of the remaining healthy intestine and close up the various different tissue layers. If you take this seriously, uh, appropriately, firstly, uh, gloving, gloving, gowning, uh, and draping and scrubbing uh, yourself as well as preparing the patient and blunt dissecting through all the layers, encountering the simulated blood vessels, clamping and ligating those, and so on. Uh, this can actually take you uh, a long time. It took me about probably about three hours to do my simulated surgery uh, here uh, for the first time I, I tried this. So it's a very effective uh, simulation despite being incredibly simple and cheap. You can even rotate these cylinders once you've used them and each cylinder can be used up to six times. Here we see examples of soft tissue um, plastic models, uh, soft, soft tissue organ models, and also saw bones in the left hand side. Um, these can be ordered um, standard or with increased fragility to simulate osteoporosis 
or with a variety of um, um, pre pre designated or custom made fractures actually. Um, the pulsating organ perfusion simulator, the pop trainer down here on the left, uh, is basically a big plastic uh, container into which you can insert major organs uh, sourced, for example, from ethically sourced cadavers or even the abattoir. Uh, you can connect major blood vessels up to um, a closed uh, circulation fluid system, uh, including a pulsatile pump which then uh, pumps uh, simulated blood around the circulatory system. Uh, and in this particular case, your simulation will bleed. Uh, there's also at least one uh, artificial simulation that, that bleeds as well. But this particular one involving uh, real organs will bleed if you cut it in the wrong place, if you accidentally cut one of its major blood vessels, for example. And this is important because it uh, provides a surgeon with opportunity to practice uh, clamping and ligating, in other words, uh, control of hemorrhage hemostatic uh, technique, which is essential to keep the surgical field clear so that the surgeon can see what they're doing and to prevent blood loss uh, unduly within the patient. So um, these surgeries can be approached uh, conventionally or through minimally invasive um, incisions, uh, essentially just uh, usually three tiny holes in this simulated uh, skin. Uh, for the insertion of a, a camera which uh, displays an image onto the screen the surgeon's watching and also uh, one of the other holes for essentially some long forceps and the other hole essentially for a long scalpel or needle driver. Of course uh, the most important form of alternative surgical training I would say is what we can see in the top right here. This is of course um, a veterinary student on the left hand side, a senior veterinary student assisting uh, the surgeon on the right hand side uh, with a spinal surgery uh, on a dog and that uh, student is getting close one-to-one -one, uh, instruction and explanation and assistance as, as they assist with uh, the surgery and in this case I was the junior veterinary surgeon I was in first year and I was behind the camera. There are also um, these wonderful um, <clears throat> computer simulations of surgery that have been developed. You can find a number of these uh, on the internet. In this uh, case, we have a simulation of that minimally invasive surgery going on by the look of it, uh, whereby um, the surgeon is viewing on the screen uh, what is occurring on the operating table behind them, uh, and they're able to manipulate the um, forceps, the needle drivers and so on and we can see heart surgery uh, being undertaken there. The patient could be on the table behind them or uh, in another operating theatre on the other side of the world. Uh, God forbid that the internet should go down part way through so you would certainly want uh, uh, bulletproof um, internet connectivity for, for uh, something like that but theoretically this is possible and maybe this is where things will go in the future. Now, an example of something a little bit more realistic is the alternative uh, veterinary surgical program uh, I established uh, when I was a veterinary student in 2000 at Murdoch University in Western Australia. And uh, it comprised several stages. We had to gain uh, external experience in private uh, veterinary clinics or animal shelters assisting with or participating in surgery and anesthesia. We also had to obtain uh, real patients, uh, for example, from animal shelters and bring them back to the university and uh, sterilize them to demonstrate that we could perform surgery to the university's high standards. We also had to attend all of the terminal surgery laboratories as observers, which was a good thing because we got to see both different types of training and were able to comment on both of them. I also bought one of those DAISY abdominal uh, surgical simulators and we also uh, conducted surgery on uh, two dogs that were being euthanized for medical reasons and we conducted abdominal and orthopedic surgeries on them. So the outcomes of this program were that we missed out uh, on at most 13 scheduled surgeries and as I said before we would have been surgeon or assistant surgeon in maybe eight to nine of those. Instead, though, we got 62 additional surgeries that uh, the other students doing the conventional program uh, did not uh, get. 
So that doesn't include the extra abdominal surgeries I performed on the DAISY surgical simulator. These surgeries performed are under close one-to-one -one supervision, which is much better level of supervision than you get in a conventional surgery course where there might be one instructor supervising four different surgical groups at the same time. So we do have direct one-to-one -one supervision, mostly in private uh, veterinary practice. Uh, our experience had both depth and breadth. Depth in the large number of sterilizations we did, jointly sterilizing 45 uh, dogs and cats, including 21 spades before we even entered the final year of our veterinary degrees. This is really significant because the spay, the female uh, ovaria hysterectomy, is a major surgery, but also a very common surgery. And it's one of the most important ones that new graduates need to be able to do and probably one of the ones they worry about the most uh, on graduation. So uh, the veterinary students in our uh, conventional program, uh, on average, was getting to do maybe one spay before they graduated. Some people would do a half a spay. Some people might do a few more. Uh, some would do none at all. So we actually managed to spay 21 cats and dogs before even entering the final year of our uh, surgical, uh, sorry, our veterinary degree. And I think this um, experience gave us a lot more confidence and competence when we started our career as new graduate veterinarians, and I certainly appreciated that. I could see how much my classmates were struggling, and I was so grateful I was not in that position. Uh, their hands were literally shaking some of the times uh, as they were tackling their first surgeries, which is entirely understandable. Uh, we also participated in a wide range of other surgeries as well, consistent with what you would normally see in general small animal practice or even large animal practice. You can see a wide range of other procedures there. Uh, we had a similar breadth and depth of anaesthetic experience. We saw uh, these cases from initial presentation, in, including the clinical history, um, preparation for surgery, the uh, anaesthesia and surgery itself, and the post-operative recovery and care. So we got the entire experience versus someone going into a conventional uh, surgical, terminal surgical laboratory doesn't get the, the benefit of seeing what the outcome is after uh, the patient is recovered and goes home. Uh, doesn't get to hear about the initial um, history that, that have led to the need for surgery, surgery in the first place. So that's what we did when I was uh, a veterinary student at West Australia's Murdoch University. That's some of what we did. In 2013, after, after practicing, I should say, as a very successful small animal veterinarian uh, in, in practice for many years, assisted by the extra experience that I had gained in the alternative surgical program. Uh, I was recruited in 2013 to go here to one of the world's largest veterinary schools to AVMA accredited Ross University School of Veterinary Medicine in the Caribbean. Interestingly situated, you can see there below a towering volcano on the island of St. Kitts. Uh, it was a very beautiful island and uh, this is the view from the uh, temporary accommodation I was placed into on arrival. I had various unexpected uh, visitors uh, come to see me, which was delightful. Most of the time, though, I spent uh, at the university where I was director of the clinical skills laboratory for a couple of years before taking up my current post. And we would teach our students, our veterinary students, uh, clinical and surgical skills starting uh, from semester one of their veterinary course and building in a stepwise fashion every semester until uh, they left uh, the island to complete their final uh, clinical years of their courses with affiliated international veterinary schools with very large teaching hospitals and caseloads, which we didn't have. Um, and our students, uh, we would get feedback from our, our veterinary school partners uh, on the US mainland and elsewhere that our students were considered to be particularly well prepared because of uh, the amount of clinical and surgical training they received. And I think that's because we did start early, started all the way as, as early as semester one and built uh, every semester uh, in a stepwise fashion their skills in our clinical skills laboratory using models, mannequins and simulations to teach uh, clinical and surgical skills. I'd like to turn briefly to uh, European educational animal use uh, with some colleagues. I just published a study in 2021 uh, looking at educational animal use in all the European Union member states. And you can see here uh, the numbers of um, 
animal, animals that are being used for educational purposes in the various member states. Um, so it's well over 100,000 simply in Europe each year, the numbers of animals that are being used. Animals are most commonly uh, being used for teaching uh, clinical skills, uh, such as uh, blood sampling, uh, handling, also for surgical training, also a lot of animals used in physiology. The animals most commonly used are rodents, pigs, uh, and rabbits, as you can see there. And sorry, uh, uh, multiple other species, as you can see there. The reasons why these uh, educators decided to use all these animals instead of uh, alternatives um, was because they felt that practice on a living animal was necessary for proper learning as the most common reason and secondly they felt that no adequate model or alternative was currently available so those were the uh, main reasons given how true are those reasons well to answer that we conducted a systematic review um, to look for studies that had examined the educational efficacy of uh, humane teaching methods and we found 50 studies comparing learning outcomes when students uh, used humane alternatives versus conventional harmful animal use published all the way back to 1968 you can see uh, your publication of all these studies here the red studies are those where the humane teaching method resulted in inferior learning outcomes. You can see there's a small number of those. The blue studies are the ones where they resulted in superior learning outcomes, and there are more of those. And the rest resulted in equivalent learning outcomes. Um, most studies related to anatomy training, followed by physiology, followed by uh, veterinary medicine surgical skills. You can see small numbers of these studies seem to result in inferior learning outcomes using the humane method, but most of them resulted in superior or equivalent learning outcomes. The humane methods used were most commonly computer simulations, models, and so on. Overall, amongst all of these 50 studies, the humane teaching methods produced learning outcomes that were superior 30% of the time equivalent 60% of the time or inferior 10% of the time to those produced by traditional harmful animal use. So overwhelmingly um, this demonstrated that the humane teaching methods produced learning outcomes at least as good in nearly all cases and sometimes better to those produced by harming animals. The surgical skills assessed in the surgery studies were uh, psycho psychomotor skills, so uh, dexterity, hand-eye coordination, ligation, so things like tying off blood vessels, intestinal surgeries, abdominal uh, closures, uh, stomach surgeries, ovarian hysterectomies, the female spay operation. Um, here is an example of a study demonstrating a superior learning outcome. This one was a fluid hemostasis model. Um, the humane alternative was uh, demonstrated to be at least as effective as practicing using a live dog and doing splenectomies, uh, removing of the spleen, which involves a lot of ligating of blood vessels, uh, for teaching the skills of blood vessel ligation and division. So the alternative was at least as effective, but students completed their ligatures more quickly, with fewer errors, and their ligatures were tighter, and a superior instrument grip when using the humane alternative. Um, so, students' initial scepticism regarding the use of the alternatives for learning these surgical skills was dramatically changed after they had a chance to actually use the model. Uh, 20 veterinary surgical students trained using plastic surgical simulators performed spay operations on live dogs with greater skill than 20 classmates that were trained via cadavers. Uh, equivalent learning outcomes were seen in at least five studies um, comparing uh, of, of veterinary surgical students. Here's uh, some demonstrating equivalent surgical skill in this type, case using cadavers as the humane option. Of course, uh, cadavers, um, when they're ethically sourced, are a humane alternative. Uh, they're not when they have been killed uh, just for teaching purposes. 
A similar result was demonstrated in these other studies using soft tissue organ models. And here we have veterinary students from an alternative uh, surgical program had surgical skills equivalent to those of standard laboratory experience after some initial hesitancy during the first live animal surgery. And a little bit of initial hesitancy is not much of a problem. Here's an example of an inferior learning outcome when the humane alternative was used. In this case, we're looking at the gastrotomy hollow organ model. So we're talking about the stomach uh, surgery simulator. Now, two groups of 20 veterinary students, one group practice using the hollow organ model, the other using a live animal. The live animal gastrotomy skills were later obsessed uh, in subsequent laboratories. There's no significant difference in overall closure techniques, so surgical technique, but the students performing the procedure for a second time on a live animal were significantly quicker. And speed is an important consideration in surgery because uh, we want animals to be under anesthesia as briefly as possible because it's safer. So this was considered a superior outcome for the live animal teaching method. In this particular case, though, it appears that the alternative model wasn't well designed. It was deficient, it was more fragile and stiff than living gastric tissue. Sutures were pulling through uh, despite being appropriately placed uh, and tightened with appropriate tension. Now, most of these uh, studies examined short-term learning outcomes, but this one here uh, examined long-term outcomes as well. It used employer questionnaires at the time of hiring and one year later to compare the skills of 12 new graduates from the Tufts University Vet class of 1990 who'd participated in an alternative small animal medical and surgical procedures course with the skills of 36 of their conventionally trained counterparts. There's no significant difference between these two groups in their ability to perform common surgical, medical and diagnostic procedures, attitude towards performing orthopedic or soft tissue surgery, confidence in performing these procedures and ability to perform them unassisted. But what about non-surgical disciplines? Here's an example uh, from cardiovascular physiology. It was more efficiently learnt using interactive video discs. Microbiology, uh, there was more active learning with greater student autonomy when using interactive databases containing digital images, movies, and sounds. Bovine rectal palpation, the procedure I mentioned earlier, was learned more effectively using that haptic uh, teaching tool that I spoke about. And passing a tube down the nose of a horse into its stomach was uh, a procedure which is important in veterinary medicine and it was learned more effectively with superior knowledge, skill and confidence using a CD-ROM. In an earlier systematic review in 2007, uh, I found a smaller number of studies compared to the one we recently performed in 2021. At that time, uh, I found 14 studies uh, looking at uh, non-veterinary uh, faculties. They were undergraduate biology, medical, nursing, pharmacology, physiology and psychology students. The humane method produced superior outcomes in about 36% of the time, the equivalent 57% of the time, and inferior in one case. The small number of inferior learning outcomes demonstrates that humane teaching methods don't always produce equivalent or superior outcomes, and it is important for the humane alternatives to be well designed. Uh, and I spoke about the flaws in the gastrotomy plastic model uh, recently as an example of one which was not well designed. Here um, are studies of the non-veterinary students, uh, if anyone is interested in looking them up, along with the sorts of humane alternatives that were used and the disciplines that they covered. And I also found 29 studies of veterinary students which did not involve comparisons of harmful animal use that demonstrated additional benefits of humane teaching methods. And those are all in my uh, 2007 publication, which uh, can be obtained along with my other publications on my website, andrewknight.info. So you can see these uh, additional studies here um, and the uh, disciplines they covered and the humane options that were used. But looking at all of those, uh, pooling them together, the key advantages were Humane alternatives often demonstrated time and cost savings, repeatability and increased flexibility of use, greater ability to customise the learning experience to a student's individual needs, for example. They clearly saved substantial numbers of animal lives because animals did not need to be 
used or killed in these studies. This increases compliance with uh, legislative and code of practice requirements about using alternatives to animals. There was decreased student exposure to toxic chemicals, which are uh, often used to preserve dissection specimens. This decreases risks of adverse health consequences, such as allergic reactions and potential uh, for liability of the uh, veterinary or medical school or biological school. There's also a decreased potential for conflict with students unwilling to harm animals during their education. Now, the Humane Society of the United States many years ago um, conducted a cost comparison of animal dissection versus humane alternatives. They uh, simulated a typical biology department uh, of over a three-year period with animals commonly dissected in high school biology, being these ones here, frogs, fetal pit, pigs, cats and dogfish. They uh, simulated uh, three classes of 30 students, so 90 students with each pair dissecting each species of animal once over the three-year period. Uh, and they found appropriate alternatives for these various different um, dissections, as you can see here. And they added up the costs uh, at the time of these animals and these alternatives. And they demonstrated a saving of uh, looks like just over, over a third, really, of the cost of the di dissections by switching to the alternative method, so several thousand dollars uh, being saved. That kind of uh, cost saving is normal. The alternatives can be used year after year on an ongoing basis after the initial purchase, and the initial purchase is usually not that expensive. Animals do need to be purchased, transported, housed, fed, provided veterinary care if necessary, killed and disposed of uh, year after year. So that's uh, actually quite considerably costly. Indeed, the time and cost savings alternatives is probably the major reason why they've been implemented into so many uh, courses around the world. There are ethical considerations as well, of course. I'd love to say these are the major reason why uh, alternatives have been produced, uh, but I, I do think it's probably the time and the cost savings. But the ethical considerations are really important. Um, it's been estimated that there are close to 6 million vertebrates dissected each year in US high schools alone. They come from biological supply companies, Class B uh, licensed animal brokers that have in the past um, been found to have sourced animals from a variety of legal and illegal uh, sources, including animal shelters, strays, and free to good home ads. There have been undercover investigations of biological uh, supply companies noting overcrowded gas chambers and other inhumane killing me uh, methods. Injection of still living animals with formaldehyde based preservatives, which is uh, extremely painful, and numerous violations of the Federal Animal Welfare Act. There are also concerns because of the very large numbers of animals being used in high school biology classes in dissections. This uh, could be adversely impacting the natural frog populations in some parts of the world, and frogs are one of the amphibious species undergoing significant and very worrying declines. We also need to consider the experiences of students that use um, animals. This was a survey of uh, 370 veterinary students conducted at the University of Illinois in 1999, where there were um, around about 100, um, I think they were pigs, dogs, um, rabbits, and other species being um, used as teaching models in uh, physiology and laboratories, so having demonstration experiments conducted on them by students. And you can see the quotes of the students here. I'm just going to let you read those now. So students being distracted by having to focus on keeping their animals alive. Um, these students are very inexperienced uh, anaesthetists. This makes it difficult to focus on learning the physiological concepts, understandably. It's going to be very stressful as well for some students, which is further distracting. Overall, um, just under 60% believe these labs were not worth the resources used, and only 20% felt they gained great benefit in this understanding of physiology from the laboratories. 
Um, shortly afterwards, these laboratories were uh, permanently ended at the University of Illinois Vet School, and, and a very similar situation occurred around about the same time at the University of Massey in their veterinary physiology class as well in New Zealand. Now, what about the effects of all this harmful animal use uh, on veterinary students, on their attitudes towards animal welfare? I uh, previously published a survey of the positions of the World Veterinary Association and four national veterinary associations on a variety of animal use practices that involve animal welfare compromises, and these were the use of so-called battery cages to house laying hens in very close quarters, small crates to house veal calves, gestation crates to house pregnant sows, again in very restricted conditions, cosmetic tail docking of dogs, and the harmful use of animals in scientific research, toxicity testing and education. I found that the official positions of the veterinary associations on all these issues actually lagged behind those of the general public on, well, on, on certainly these first three issues here. The only practice condemned by most people and also opposed by most veterinary associations was the cosmetic tail docking of dogs. So why um, are the positions of veterinary associations often behind those of the general public on animal welfare issues? Well, if we think about veterinary student education, um, we are increasingly speaking about the importance of educating veterinary students about animal welfare and of assisting the development of the critical reasoning skills that they need to successfully negotiate ethical controversies in practice. However, the proportion of students actually receiving education in these matters remains quite small. On the other hand, there's this hidden curriculum endorsing harmful animal use, which remains common within veterinary schools. This involves the uh, dissection, of, often of purpose-killed animals or those from ethically de debatable sources in anatomy, uh, the use of uh, living animals to conduct demonstration experiments on in subjects such as physiology, biochemistry and pharmacology, animals usually being killed during or after the experiment, and terminal surgical and anaesthetic laboratories. So, in short, the majority of veterinary students receive little formal um, education in animal welfare issues or critical reasoning, and they're directly required to harm and kill animals during their education. The unspoken message here is that animal harming and killing is not only condoned, but is actually required to become a veterinarian. And also the animal welfare concerns are subservient to human interests of debatable merit. Um, this gives negative underlying messages about the intrinsic value of, of animal lives uh, from authority figures, uh, veterinary professors, for example. Uh, the stress uh, for students that have not previously had to be directly involved in animal killing or trying to keep animal patients alive um, un under those circumstances. Uh, in those physiology demonstration laboratories, for example can actually result in impairment of cognitive abilities, uh, decreasing uh, things like memory, uh, capacity to learn. There can be desensitization to animal suffering and killing, and even a diminished capacity for compassion and ethical decision making. Why do I make these claims? Because they've been documented in studies of veterinary students. Uh, the decreasing awareness of vet students of animal sentience, specifically hunger, pain, fear, and boredom of dogs, cats, and cows, over the duration of the veterinary courses has been documented, along with the decreased likelihood of senior veterinary students to provide appropriate perioperative analgesia, so that is appropriate pain control around the time of surgery, when compared to more junior veterinary students. And there has even been documented uh, the inhibition of the normal development of moral reasoning ability over the duration of veterinary schools, something that developed in all other student cohorts from other courses, but not in the veterinary students. So something in the veterinary course is holding back the development of moral reasoning ability. So I think that these sorts of documented phenomena are actually very disturbing psychological adaptations, which enable previously caring students to cope, which enable them to withstand the stress that results from requirements to harm and kill sentient animals when it's not clearly and overwhelmingly necessary. So, as well as directly saving substantial numbers of animal lives within veterinary curricula, 
the use of humane teaching methods are more likely to result in veterinary graduates with higher animal welfare standards. Uh, this is more likely to benefit their future patients. And it's also more likely to result in veterinarians and their professional associations adopting progressive positions on animal welfare issues and then becoming leaders rather than followers of evolving social standards on animal welfare as quite rightly expected by society at large. Finally, the implementation of humane teaching methods uh, decreases the potential for conflict with students who don't wish to harm animals in their education. Safia Rubai was uh, a graduate of the University of Colorado School of Medicine in 1995. She initial, initially failed physiology uh, within the medical course because she refused to um, conduct an experiment on an anaesthetized dog and then kill it. Uh, so she failed the course, so she uh, took physiology at another veterinary school that uh, offered a humane alternative, sorry, another medical school that offered a humane alternative and didn't require this killing of dogs. She then uh, carried on with her University of Colorado uh, medical course and duly graduated from the medical course in 1995. In the same year, she then sued the University of Colorado School of Medicine for 95000 US dollars as well as paying out to the student, the uh, university was required uh, uh, moving forward to set up uh, an alternative program for any students that didn't wish to kill uh, dogs in the physiology class. So cases like these have been numerous. Students almost always win them because as you can see, the educational evidence in favor of human teaching methods is, is overwhelming. Uh, and there are many successful examples around the world of where those methods have been success successfully implemented. Given these factors, it is uh, virtually impossible for uh, educationalists and their institutions to successfully claim in court that it is necessary to harm animals in education. So students virtually always win these cases. And this has uh, resulted in the introduction of so-called uh, student choice legislation or conscientious objection policies in increasing numbers of uh, states within the US and around the world. When these conflicts do occur, um, they are a public relations disaster, usually for uh, veterinary schools and universities, because um, it's very damaging to the image of uh, a university for it to get into the mainstream media that it is requiring students who want to become doctors and veterinarians to harm and kill animals in their education, and particularly when it can be so clearly demonstrated that this is unnecessary. Accordingly, there are much better ways that universities can and should handle the issue of student conscientious objection to harmful animal use. So I have gone through existing approaches in some detail and provided examples of best practice processes and conscientious objection policies and I've made that information available within my publication here, which is also available at my website, andrewknight.info. So in conclusion, well-designed humane alternatives usually perform at least as well as methods that rely upon harmful animal use, in some case achieving superior learning outcomes. I think it's obvious that educators can best serve their students and animals and can minimise financial and time burdens by introducing well-designed humane teaching methodologies. For anyone wanting further information about uh, educational animal use and alternatives, uh, for students seeking advice on how to raise this issue with their universities um, and to, to succeed, advice for universities on how to handle this issue uh, for those seeking uh, libraries from which alternatives can be borrowed, free online computer simulations, comprehensive alternatives databases, and hundreds of educational studies of alternatives organised by discipline, these are available at these websites here, humanelearning.info and interniche.org. And humanelearning.info is my own website. So thank you very much. I hope that's been interesting and worthwhile. And um, I guess I would close by saying that harmful animal use is probably more strongly justified uh, in 
veterinary education than in any other type of education. Uh, vets need to learn how to do surgery. Uh, they need to know about the physiology, the anatomy, the functioning of animals. So if I and many others uh, can go through veterinary surgical courses and veterinary programs around the world without harming any animals in doing so and going on to be very successful qualified veterinarians, then um, I think any students anywhere should be able to successfully complete their education, move forward with their careers without harming animals uh, in their education. Um, <clears throat> there is no need to kill to learn how to heal uh, and to become successful veterinarians or uh, successful in any other biological and life sciences in endeavour, health sciences endeavour. Thank you very much.